Today's podcast is sponsored by one of our favorite products, Almond Cow. We've been using it for well over a year, and I say we, mostly my husband, Mark, who is mooing. Honey, what are your thoughts about Almond Cow? <laughs> this is the moo man. He's back. <laughs> I love the Almond Cow because we know how great it is. Anything that you can make a plant-based milk with, you're set. I don't need to make that much. It's just sitting in the pantry. And then when we're ready, I just make it. It takes a minute. It tastes so good. It tastes so good. And for those of you who are thinking about it, let me tell you why. There are no added preservatives, any kind of artificial stuff. You put in it what you want. You can sweeten it to your taste. It is so easy to make, so easy to clean up. And it's pure gold. It really is. And they give you a lot of recipes on the Almond Cow website. You have the recipe, so you don't have to think, you don't have to go anywhere to find it. It's there for you. Yes, we love it so much. So if you're interested in getting your own, go check out the link or just go to their site, almondcal.co, and you can use code Lara, L-A-R-A, for extra savings. Go get yourself one and have fun. I'm Laura Hyman, and welcome to Redefining Movement, a lit podcast designed to investigate all aspects of movement, from my background in physical therapy and neuroscience. My mission is to help everyone find freedom through smarter movement patterns and compassion for ourselves and others. So together we can live our most uplifted lives, benefiting all beings. Welcome to Wednesday Q&A, where you all ask the questions and we answer. I'm joined by my beautiful, talented, intelligent, and gorgeous co-host, Kristen Williams. Hey, Laura. We were so lucky. We spent the weekend together. I'm still riding that high. I don't know about you. Absolutely. It was so much fun. It really was. All right, let's get started. Hey, everybody. So we are going to get it kicked off here with a question that came in via Instagram. What should I do if I've been told I have a torn hip labrum? What will help in my practice? And that is not a fun diagnosis, especially not for someone who is active in yoga or any type of movement practice like lit, where there's repetitive flexion at the hips, particularly traditional yoga, where there is a lot of anterior tilting of the pelvis. When we think about the labrum of the hip, that's the socket of the hip joint, which is part of the pelvis. And so the position of the pelvis really does matter when it comes to a torn labrum. Now, I will say torn labrum, not the end of the world. You can absolutely function with a torn labrum, whether it's the hip, whether it's the shoulder. What the labrum does is it provides a little extra surface area for the socket. So if you can imagine like a shallow cup that has a ring around the outside that just gives a little more grip for the ball within the socket A lot of times it's in the front. They have an anterior tear or even like an impingement of the labrum, especially in Western societies. That's where we'll see that more often. And so then when they go to flex, they go to bend over, it doesn't feel good because there's maybe a little flap that's getting caught. And so something like yoga or any type of squatting activity is going to be uncomfortable. Her question is, what can I do for it? Well, first of all, I have worked with a lot of people both in the clinic setting and then also yogis, so much so that I created a hip pathology series that is on the lit daily where I modify a regular lit practice, which can be applicable to any type of yoga practice using blocks. That's one way to do it. We can use blocks to keep the space more open, especially if it's bothering you on the mat or if you practice and then it bothers you after that. But if you don't practice, you don't have pain. That's what you want to look and see. What might be triggering it? So if your practice is bothering it, first thing you can do is use blocks to give it more space. Biggest thing you can do is really look at your technique. Think about it structurally. What might you be doing that's either sinking into that anterior capsule or compressing it? And we see that a lot with the forward folds where people are just collapsing, anteriorly tilting the pelvis, it gets pinched. Or we see it in the low lunges where, again, they're sinking in to the front of the hip capsule, which if that thing is irritated, it's like scratching a scab. So these do really well if you learn how to move better. But I would argue there is probably a movement dysfunction 
adjust the way you're moving, the way you're practicing. And if it's not being aggravated by your movement practice, how are you walking around? How are you positioning yourself in life that may have caused this? I had a client who was a pumpkin farmer. So for a couple days every year, she was planting seeds flex for hours. And it's no wonder that happened. Laura, I know you've got a lot of other great stuff to add. What do you have to add to that? Everything you said, I would totally agree with. And I always look at those soft tissue, passive restraint injuries. What is your form? Because form is really going to dictate function. It's going to set you up moving functionally, meaning in daily life through all the different ways we move. It's going to help that a lot. It'll optimize it. I just got a message from somebody about tearing their proximal hamstring. So this is at the bottom of the pelvis. So all of these are soft tissue areas, different components of collagen, and elastin, different angles and whatnot. But if you're not holding your pelvis with stability, which is its job, then you can set yourself up to put more strain on those areas, whether it's the proximal hamstring tendon, which comes up and inserts on the ischial tuberosity or the sit bone, whether it's the labrum or some of those front hip ligaments that the pelvis is tipping and sinking into it. So I would really recommend, and this is hard for people sometimes, to back out of things. Yes, use blocks like Kristen said. I've used a little rolled up towel or blanket for people to actually hold that space. Also to get that neural understanding. When I flex at my hips, I'm not tipping my pelvis onto my thigh bone. That's a very different feeling. Having all these different feedbacks is going to be helpful. So you just roll up a towel. You don't want it too thick because you just want it to have like an inch of squishiness that you can feed right into your hip crease. Go back into your glutes, keep your spine long as you hip hinge and see how low you can go before you start to feel you can't stay in that position. You'll start to feel yourself move on to the towel more. Or if you feel any of that pinching, certainly don't go there. Kristen often talks about that's a yellow light, just back off of it. But it's really about rewiring the movement patterns because people can live with labral tears their entire life and never get them fixed. It used to be if you had a labral tear, say 20 years ago, in our earlier days in PT, a lot of orthopedics would go in and fix it. And it really sets you up for a whole host of other things. Unless there's a part that really is in the way and you can take a little pinch out of there and remove it, a lot of people can live with micro tears. You don't want to make it worse though. You're going to be limited on what you can do. So Backtrack a little bit in terms of how big your movement is and focus on pelvis stability. Kristen has this wonderful hip pathology. We have all kinds of classes that emphasize neutral pelvis and neutral spine. It doesn't mean you're going to get it right away, but it's always emphasized in our classes. That's another big differentiator between us and other styles of yoga where we're not looking for big movement. We're looking for controlled movement. And that's a very different feeling. So I would love if you report back and let us know if this was helpful at all. Today's podcast is sponsored by Aminoco. I've been using Aminoco products for well over a year, and I really love them. I love the taste, but most importantly, I love the science-backed health benefits. Today, I'm going to tell you about life. Life is the name of it. So life is really great for those of us over age 40. Why? Because did you know muscle and heart function start to decline after age 40? So in clinical trials, LIFE has been shown to enhance the physical function and muscle strength while supporting normal cardiovascular health. So at age 53 and a half, I'm really concerned about maintaining my muscle density and of course my heart health. So I use this, I put one scoop in with water, but you could put it into a smoothie, you can put it into juice, and it is vegan, it is GMO-free, and it is patent produced. It's an amazing, amazing product. And you can go to aminoco.com that's A-M-I-N-O-C-O dot com slash lit and save 30%. Okay, so next question is going to be from Sun and Salads. She wrote, any tips for how to thrive through months of the year when daylight is in short supply? I have talked about this on my monthly motivation, and I think the best thing to do is to embrace it. Embrace it in the sense that it is a change that you know is going to happen and think of what that particular change could bring you in a positive way, meaning maybe it's a little more nurturing time. It's a grounding time. Maybe it's a time to slow down when the period of light during the day is decreased. Plan around that. 
really capitalize on the light moments so that you can continue to do your movement practice, continue to get fresh air and get outside, get sunlight because you need that morning sunlight to help your circadian pacemaker so that you will be able to sleep well as well. But also embrace that maybe you aren't going to be as go like you would in the summer months where it's like 12 to 14 hours of daylight. And that's okay. I think it's nice for us to go through these shifts as long as we at our essence have a thread line of good habits. I know for me, I'm going to move regardless of the seasons. It's already part of my lifestyle. So if that's not your work, for instance, do make it work for you, whether it's working out a little bit earlier in the day or anything like that. I'm right there with you. I mean, I should have lived 200 years ago where there were no alarm clocks. I wake up the second there's the hint of light and I get tired when there's not. And so this is definitely a struggle for me. I can feel that sleepiness that comes on, even though I'm not ready for bed, just when it gets dark. I agree with you, Laura. I do think learning to embrace it, trying to stay away from my screen. I still get up at the same time. I'm still working out in the dark. We have a lot of people who post videos of themselves doing our flows, and it's fun to watch the sunrise behind them. There's the joy of that. Maybe you get to experience a sunrise that you normally wouldn't. The same thing might go for a sunset. But I do know people who swear by the UV lights that really does help them with that response to just getting that sunlight. Because luckily enough for me, I'm in the north. So usually when it's cold, there is snow. And I think that is the beauty of nature where you get that during the summer, maybe with the blue sky, but spring and fall can be more cloudy and it feels more dreary. But when it is snowy, open your shades, make sure you've got as much sunlight as possible. But I'm right there with you. Yeah. And I think if we think of ourselves as organisms, like any other organism, we go through these cycles and there might be people who live and it's 70 and sunny year round. And I'm always curious like how that feels for them. But again, honor that this is the time we might be getting a little more contracted, not physically, but just inward and reflective. It's also the end of a year. That's a time to know that that can be really tiring. Work-wise, it might be tiring. Physically, it might be tiring. And again, embracing it as much as you can without letting it get you heavy. I think it's important to know when you're fatigued because you're getting into a depressed state psychologically versus you're sleeping more because it's just dark earlier, but you still have energy and vitality during the day. And the last thing I'd say is, if you can, plan something where you do get away a little bit and you do get some extra sunshine because it can be like a huge dopamine hit that stays with you. I know I did that I've been living up in the Northeast now for a long time and the winter is February and especially would start to get to me. But I started just planning some getaway. That's when I have my retreats, but you don't have to spend a lot of money if possible, just try and get away a little bit. And that little bit of dose, I promise you, it almost stretches you right into the spring. All right. One last question here. This one was sent by Kelly into our email She said, I just got into gravel biking, apparently the new hotness. I am previously only a bike commuter and have never really ridden the kind of mileage I'm doing now. My ultimate goal is to bike a 100-mile gravel event next year in June, which means keeping my body as happy as possible. I already struggle with tightness in my traps, etc., don't we all? And this is definitely aggravated on my weekend rides. Wondering if you can speak to preventative maintenance for bikers in order to manage these impossible imbalances or injuries that can occur. Thanks for all you do. I'm a regular podcast listener and lit mover. Lit makes me feel better and move smarter. Yeah, I mean, that's tough. I am not a cyclist myself, but I do work with a lot of people who do cycle. And the number one thing I would say is bike fit. There are people who specialize in this and it can be a game changer. You're increasing your mileage. So you're on this thing longer. So bike fit, number one. And what she means by that, everybody, is the setup, like how high your handlebars are, all that stuff, that it really fits the body to support it. Absolutely. And then your training. That's a big mistake people make, not just bikers, runners, swimmers. We get so excited to do something. Like you said, you were just a commuter on a bike and now you're training for a hundred miles. That's the equivalent of basically someone who only walks to decide to run a marathon. Your first marathon, you should train 
upwards of a year to really build that endurance. And it's muscular endurance. It's not just the cardio. It is the tolerance. When we think about cycling, especially for the upper traps, that is an endurance. The upper traps are holding you stationary for a long time. The legs are moving. The legs are pumping. That's where you're going to see your tendonitis and things that might creep up. But when we see the upper extremity, the upper back, the neck issues with biking, it is that prolonged positioning, finding ways where you can switch it up a bit. I know a lot of people will go down to their forearms just to change the position because it gets a different muscle group. With the bike, you really can't do that unless you are changing positions, lowering down onto your forearms, coming back up, being intentional with that. And then when you're off the bike, Kelly, what can you do? What are you doing? I love that you're doing lit, thinking about the triple S. The harsh reality of the triple S is the term we use for skull, scapula, and sacrum all lining up that kind of nice posture. With biking, you're not going to have it. So what can you do off the bike to combat that? Good cervical stretching, upper back mobility, deep cervical strengthening, really thinking about how you're positioning. Because most of us, let's be honest, myself included, are already in a forward head posture from working on the computer. We start sitting and slouching. It's like a modeled behavior. So we're in that position already. Then we go and bike for hours and we're holding that. So it's going to have to be an intentional practice on your end to really think about where you are for the long periods throughout the day, where you know you're going to be on the bike, the little changes you can make there. But I think a lot of it's going to happen off the bike. Laura, what else do you have to add to that? I would agree wholeheartedly to make sure that you're countering it. And I'll say we have a Start Here series, which is very short classes. The spine, the shoulders, core and breath will be really good too. But just to bring some balance into that positioning And the other thing is, I'll just echo what Kristen said. I have done a lot of endurance biking. My husband and I biked cross country and we did definitely clock in over 100 mile days. I was turning 30, so that was a bit ago. But what I do know is changing position. This is what I love about gravel. The demand is different. On the road, you can really get locked into one position. Whereas gravel, I would very intentionally like have your forearms down, have your hands down, really sit up almost like you're doing a beach bike. And change those positions so you can give your upper back and neck a break. That has helped me tremendously. I didn't really have too much of that stuff because I changed the position. I wasn't trying to go super fast. I just wanted to get it done. And that's what's cool about doing 100 miles is in a way, you're just trying to accomplish that. Obviously, if you stay hinged forward, you're more streamlined. But getting your trunk upright is such a relief. And it changes the dynamics with your legs too. But gravel, I think, is awesome in that way because it's going to require different firing of the legs and the glutes and then maybe more quads there. But you're ultimately giving yourself a break. So when you're on the bike, I totally recommend that. And then off the bike, you're not going to have as much time. So you don't need to take a lot of time, but just be consistent with unwinding some of that tissue, getting some chest openings. You're on Lit Daily. It's all there. Use the filters and go for it. And good luck. That sounds amazing. Those are great questions. What a great combination from all of you, hip biking and how to manage the winter months. So as always, you can write us. We love your questions. Any type of question, we will attempt to answer with our opinions and our background. So you can write us at support at lityoga.com. You can always write that you want it to be anonymous. We will totally honor that. You can also find us on social media. Lara is lara.hyman. I'm KB Williams 99, or you can find us at the Redefining Movement podcast, social media and DM there, which someone did. And those get forwarded to us and we put them in our little folder and try to get to them. We have decreased our cadence. So now we're every other week. So it might take a little longer to get them answered, but send them in. We will get to them. We will. And as always, we're pulling for you. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Redefining Movement. If you like what you've heard, please like and subscribe wherever you get your podcast. Feel free to leave us a rating and review or share with someone you know. Check us out at www.litmethod.com.